Good afternoon. Let's continue our discussion on memory management and pointers. And this will bring us into the topic of polymorphism. So let's just quickly recall this main paradigm for memory management and the two main types of memory that we're going to have control over. One is this idea of the stack memory, and the other one is the heap. And remember, a statement like int pointer a equals new int of 5, what it means is create a variable of type integer pointer or int pointer a on the stack. So a is here. And then what it's saying is create an array of size 5 of ints on the heap. And then what new does is new is actually an operator. And it calls this function, which allocates the memory. And what it returns, it returns the address of the first element. And that's what A has as its value. It's the address of that first element. So A is itself a stack variable. When we call delete, open, close, square brackets on A, the variable A being a stack variable, that's still a perfectly reasonable int pointer that you, we could use in the future. But the memory for which it currently points to, the value of that address is not reserved for the use of A to be dereferencing and, and working with. Okay? So calling new reserves that memory, and A has every right to access those contents in memory. As soon as you call delete, though, that memory goes away, even though the pointer A is still active. And that's because A is a stack variable. So it's still in existence until the end of the function, wherever it was defined. But the memory that it points to was allocated and then deallocated. And so that memory is no longer a valid state with which to interpret as an int. Okay? Um, that's, that's saying warning pointer A still exists on the stack. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, this is the idea behind how vectors work. Vectors work the exact same way, except they don't demand that you uh, have any calls to new and delete anywhere. They'll do all the newing and deleting for you. Okay? So that's a wonderful thing, because when you work with vectors, it's so much nicer to think about than passing in arrays or pointers or this. So you just pass in an object of type v, or of type vector of ints. Okay? And you think of it like just an int or a double variable. You can pass by value, you can pass by reference, and there's no real kind of trick in the back of your mind saying, uh, this is actually a pointer type, so what am I actually passing in? No, it's just you passing in an object. And that object is sort of the gateway or the handle which allows you to access the elements that lie on the heap. When you're done with that object, the, the class structure, the way it's defined, frees up or uh, de uh, deallocates all the memory that was allocated on the heap in the first place. Okay? So just to, again, recall, all of these variables I've created here are on the stack. And all of those elements in that array are also on the stack. Why are they all on the stack? Because A, these are all fundamental types. And B, there's no news anywhere. Okay? There's no new. There's no calls to new. Okay? So even an array, by default, if there's no new, it creates its elements on the stack. So what we know is we can create an array of elements either on the stack or on the heap. Now, knowing this can explain this really kind of weird behavior that you will sometimes encounter, which is the following. Uh, forget about this, all the bullet points. I put a lot of bullet points on here. Just look at that code up there. Has anyone ever tried to do this? Try to create an array of a size input by the user. You can't actually do this in C++ without using a Mac. Okay. Let me just repeat that. This is not valid C++ standard code. It works on a Mac, though. Okay? It'll work on Xcode, because they use a non-standard extension of the, OK, it's in the bullet point. Okay? But the point is, this is technically not valid code. If you try to run this on a Windows machine, it will not compile, because it probably doesn't, well, most likely won't compile, because it doesn't use the same non-standard extension. What makes this even more confusing is that this is perfectly valid C code. But we're not programming in C. 
Oh, but C and C++ are almost the same. They're really similar. They have a lot of really, yeah, here's one place where they're different, okay? So this is what's called a variable length array. It will not work in C++ according to the standard. It will work on a Mac, though, okay? But you should not do it. Instead, if you wanted a variable length array, you can absolutely create one, but it has to be on the heap. Okay? You just can't create it on the stack. You have to create it on the heap. No error. It doesn't matter what platform you're on. This is legal C++ syntax. Okay? That's what I skipped over very quickly last, at the end of last time. Okay, so this is from more from last time. If you have a call to new, you need a corresponding call to delete. And then I give an example here of, here's where things can go horribly wrong. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this code. You have a fraction object A. You have a fraction pointer, which, give, which you're giving the address of A to. That's fine. Calling A.print prints out the value. Calling ptrfrac.print prints out the value. Um, so this pointer, ptrfrac, lies on the stack, just like all of our variables do. But then this ptr new frac, now the pointer itself lies on the stack, but the fraction object lies on the heap. Okay? So somebody's responsible for deleting this object. Doesn't have to be the initial pointer. Somebody has to eventually delete this nude object. Maybe I shouldn't use that word in that tense like that. Okay, all right. Um, and some people are like, "What are you talking? What are you talking?" About? Watch the video again. It makes sense. Okay, so pointer new frac dot print perfectly fine. Uh, pointer new frac equals the address of a. Ah, is this line valid? Yes, but now nobody else knew about the whereabouts of our fraction object. Okay? So nobody else can delete it. So it's lost. In other words, it's a memory leak. That fraction object will continue to stick around until the end of the program. Now, if you're writing an operating system that's meant to be running days at a time, then if you have an operating system that's always running, or a server that's always running in the background, and you keep leaking memory like 8 bytes at a time, 10 bytes at a time, eventually that really slows things down and, and puts a big bloat on the available memory. Okay? So again, once the program finishes, everything that was, was created for the project gets, you know, gets, gets you know, uh, cleaned up. But w as long as the program is running, that memory is still in reserve. So this is fine code, syntactically correct, it'll compile and run, but just we want to be aware of this. If we knew anything, we need to be aware that we have to be able to delete it later on. Uh, when it comes to small amounts of memory, you might think, big deal. In particular, if you, try to, if you have, create a memory leak inside of a loop, which is what usually happens, then when you do a loop on, like, say, 100 fractions, you say, ah, no, this works, my code works just fine. And then someone's like, yeah, how, how many fraction objects can you create? You bump it up to like a million or something, and all of a sudden your computer just does some weird stuff. Like, why did it do that? Well, it did that because you didn't, while the program is running, it cre keeps trying to create more and more fraction objects, and it doesn't clean up after itself until you exit out of the program. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over this. You might delete, try to delete an object twice. That's, that's okay. Um, I'm going to skip this part on null as well, okay? Because I want to get to the polymorphism part. Okay, so okay, we know how memory is managed, stack heap. Uh, we also know how pointers work, okay? Pointers point to an object, okay? Now, there's some really cool things you can do with this idea with class inheritance, okay? So let's, let's I'm going to tell you a story 
over the next few slides. And it's building off of the, the end goal is this idea of polymorphism. So let's consider this following set of code. You have a vector of what? Int pointers. Okay, so you're going to store the addresses of ints, int variables. Okay, so you create a vector of those. Now you create four stack variables, A, B, and C, each with numerical values. And now you add to your vector the address of A, the address of B, the address of C, the address of D. Is this okay? Yeah, yeah, you could do this, yeah. You may have already tried to do something like this before, okay? This is fine, because vector does not by default call delete or new or anything like that. It merely says, you gave me a vector of pointers, just give me an address to fill those values, period. That's all it does, okay? So, the pointers themselves lie on the heap, and the addresses that those pointers contain lie where? On the stack. But where they're actually located is irrelevant because there's no new and deletes that we're manually doing for ourselves. Okay? So we can access, and this is what's kind of weird looking code right here, right? You're dereferencing vec of zero. Kind of cool. So just to go to show, vec of zero is a pointer type, and you're dereferencing it. Uh, another way to do it, um, now I'm cleaning up the code. Okay, so another way to do it is, is instead of pushback, just so you guys know, you don't have to do this right now, but just I want, I want to get you guys thinking this way. Pushback is, in general, a slow thing to do. Pushback is a slow operation in a lot of cases. If you know exactly how much memory you want initially, it's typically better to initialize it right away, vec of four, okay? And then assign the values as you need them, okay? Pushback, popback, those are really useful if you don't know in advance how large you need your collection of objects to be. Um, now, okay, so here's a, this is a slight review from, from, this is one of the first slides usually. Um, if you want to loop through each number, you can do something like this. It's a little bit more loopy way to do it. Um, and then I showed you guys this way to do it, which is, right, you make both i and n local to the loop. And then I showed you guys one more thing, right? Do you guys remember what, what was in that last thing? There was a weird word you probably never saw before. Yeah, I watched watch this. And then there's this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why did I use prefix instead of postfix is the question. Remember what I said about if it's just an integer type, you don't really need to worry either one way or the other. If it's a class object, then prefix does what that postfix doesn't. What's the difference between prefix and postfix? Okay, so it increments before the, the line. Well, but, that, but if it's on a line by itself, prefix and postfix really essentially do the same thing. But we know with the postfix, what does it do that's extra that the prefix doesn't do? Makes a copy. Now, when it comes to a data type like an int or a size t, probably the compiler will optimize it away anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. But in general, if you have the choice between the two, and maybe i is a class object rather than just like a size t, then you would always use the prefix, plus plus. Okay? But for a for loop like this, I'll use them interchangeably, i plus plus, plus plus i. You'll see i plus plus everywhere, that's just ingrained into, into like from, left over from c. So like I said, for fundamental types, probably shouldn't matter. In a for loop like this, it's not going to matter. But for object types, it can absolutely make a difference. So I'm just wondering, because it's size is 0, and then you plus plus i, uh -huh. and then c of vector 1. Ah, no, 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 remember the for, OK, okay this is a good, good review. I'm glad, I'm glad the student asked. OK, so let's just recall. The semicolons are here and here. Remember, with a for loop, 
we run the entire first clause first and only once. That's the first thing we do. So we set i equal to 0, n equal to vec dot size. So we've created variables i and n. Then we check the test condition second. i is less than n. OK, great. And we don't call this until after we've run this line. Right? So we go from the initial test condition, then we run this. Then we call the increment step, test condition, run this. Incre so we don't call it right away. It's, it, it, it gets called the same way. Yeah. The only real difference that this makes is if you set, say, size t b equals plus plus i versus i plus plus. Then the value of b depends very much on whether the increment is before or after. But remember, i plus plus or plus plus i on a line by itself has the same noticeable effect, observable effect. And then I blew everyone's mind with this really weird syntax. Um, this is C11 syntax uh, for auto x in vec, C out x. It's kind of a neat way. Basically, for each element x in the vector vec, C out x is going to play the role of the first element. You're going you're gonna to dereference it and print it out. x is going to play the role of the second element. You're going to apply the same thing. thing. So, this is another way to do it. This is called a range-based for loop. Yeah, question. You can do this to any container type that has certain operations defined. I believe, yes, you can do it with arrays. You can do it with vectors. You can do it with a lot of other data types as well. You could create your own class. And as long as you overload the appropriate operators, you could apply the syntax to them as well. OK? So yes, this code here just lit gets literally converted to a different set of code using pointers and plus pluses and dereferencing. And as long as your class object vec comes from a class that has those operations defined, you can write this syntax and it will work for them as well. Yeah, question. Is there any speed advantage to using this over the usual one? Um, so in principle, well, it just depends on how the compiler interprets the code you've written. It has the potential, yes, it might make it run faster. It has the potential maybe to make it run slower. The only way to be sure is to actually run some simulations and then, or you can look at the actual code that got, it, got mapped to, interpreted as, and you could say, ah, oh, when I wrote it this way, I got these five sets of instructions, and when I wrote it this way, I got these 20, and these five instructions were inside this 20, so it runs at least as, but otherwise it's kind of, it's just more of, you, you try one, you see how it works, you try the other one, if it works faster, then you, you go with the one that's faster. This code is actually really nice to read. When we're not working with vectors anymore, when we're working with other types of containers, you will prefer this for many other reasons. And we'll have less to do with speed efficiency and more to do with just code readability. This will be the preferred choice. So I just want to kind of throw it in there right now. You might think to yourself, ah, oh, well, this loop form's not so bad. It's perfectly readable for me by now. But this is going to be the most readable way of doing things in the future. OK, so back to pointers. Well, what if I wanted to store a collection of pointers to, rather than an int or a double, like numerical types, right? I mean, a double is a numerical type. You might want to just store a collection of pointers to numbers. Some of them might be ints. Some of them might be doubles. Can you do this? Well, not using a vector like in this fashion. Okay, An int pointer is going to interpret its elements differently than a double pointer. Now, it's just going to store an address in memory. So there's no inherent memory issue here, right? An address is an address. It has the same size no matter what. So there's no constraint physically on, oh, well, a double pointer takes up more memory than an int pointer. No, no, no. It's not that at all. It's a logical error. It's basically saying you cannot have a vector of ints and give it the address of a double because that double is stored internally different than an int. 
and an int pointer is not equipped to interpret that double value. Okay. So this will not work. But, 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 okay. What if we have, an, say, an int here and a double here? Let's say these are class objects and they both inherit from the same base class. And I want to access properties that are common to both of them, but only in the base class. In principle, then, I should be able to just have a pointer to the base class. And that pointer to the base class is only aware of that, that class's properties. But because these classes inherit from it, I have each object has those properties. Okay? So this is the idea with color point 2D and, say, a weighted point 2D. Let's suppose you just care about accessing the x and y values of these objects. Well, as long as they both inherit from the point 2D class, they have the properties of x and y. There's no real reason why you would necessarily have to have a color point 2D pointer and a, or a weighted point 2D pointer. If the only properties you want to access are known to the point 2D pointer, then it's actually OK. So here's, here's how this works. Okay, Forget about that for a moment. Let's go the opposite direction. Forget about pointers for a second. If I have a color point 2D object, should I be able to make a point 2D object out of that color point 2D object? Anything unreasonable about that? So think about that. If I take a point with an x and y coordinate and a color, and I want to create a new point to the object based off of that color point to the object, what could I possibly do? Ignore the color. Yeah, just ignore the color, right? Perfectly reasonable. I'm not arbitrarily adding in any information. All I'm doing is taking away some stuff. Okay, so it's kind of like saying I have a collection of points in space. Some of them have all these extra properties of color or weight, and I just want to access their x and y values. In other words, I want to sort of map down or project down to a smaller set of objects or a smaller set of properties. This is what's called slicing. Okay, so if I have a point 2D object P2D and I have a color point 2D object CP2D, well, forget about P2D, for color point 2D, CP2D. I can make a base class object out of color point 2D by just assigning it in that way. What it will do is it will take all of the properties of the color point 2D object that are shared by the point 2D object or that are, that are part of the point 2D object. It will just copy all those values over. And then to the property of color, what, is, what will it do to it? Just ignore it. Okay. So now what you have is a color point 2D which retains its own properties. It hasn't been modified. And then P-slice, which is also the name of my favorite wrapper, uh, P-slice gets all of the x and y values from the color point 2D object, but is itself a color point 2D, or just itself a point 2D object. Okay. So this is what's called slicing. This is going in the other direction. I have an object with more properties than I want, and I want to create an object in the base class. Okay. Now, here is something that is also legal. This goes in line with our, our uh, you know, vector of pointers. Okay? So we can slice, so we can go from a color point to the object and create a point to the object from it. But what we can also do is go in the other direction, which is say, OK, I have a point to the pointer, which is aware of properties of x and y and maybe some other member functions. All color point to the objects and all weighted point to the objects have those properties as well. So I should still be able to point to them using this base class pointer because those objects have all of those properties. That's the idea. 
So this line of code here, this is perfectly uh, valid. We create a vector of point 2D pointers. Pointers to the base class, uh, yeah, base class pointers. We create points, new point 2D of 1, 2. That creates a new point 2D object where? On the heap. An object of type point 2D. Now the second line, new color point 2D, 2, 3, red, creates a new color point 2D object on the heap. And it returns the address for my vector of points. Okay. Same thing with weighted point 2D. Now I can call print on all of these pointers. But this is going to print 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. In other words, here's the question. Did the pointer slice away the properties? The answer is no. But the pointer is not aware of the other properties. So even though color point 2D might have its own print function, we're not going to call that one because a point 2D pointer does, is not aware of any of the color point 2D properties. Okay? So when you call print on it, it's only going to call the point 2D print function. Okay? Let me demonstrate in code just so we can really play around with this and Okay? Well, there's my fraction class, there's my point 2D class. So you have a print function in my point 2D, and I have a print function in my color point 2D from last time. Okay, so let's start afresh. With, okay, let's create a point 2D P34. Let's create a color point 2D P256 blue or did I do I did blue first I think right yeah okay blue five six um, now let's create point 2d p3 equals p2 do p dot print p2 dot print p3 dot print Okay, so like we said before, when, we, when the object itself, color point 2D P2, has a print function defined, it will default to the most you know, inherited class version of it. Okay, so it prints out its own color point 2D print function, uses that. Now, let's try and make pointers to these objects. So point 2D pointer PTR equals the address of P2. Now if we try to do PTR print, what do you think is going to get printed out at the last line? Anyone have a guess as to what the last line is going to look like? Five, six. Five, six. Okay? So again, you can slice, and that will create a completely separate object, which has after that line of code, it has nothing to do with that, that color point to the object. Okay? But you can also point to an object with more properties than what that base class pointer knows about. Okay? But if you do that, then when you try and call the print function using the base class pointer, it's not aware of the fact that color point, it's pointing to a color point to the object. It just thinks I'm pointing to some type of point to the object. It has a print function. I shall call that print function. I take it by your smile, it makes sense. Yeah. And is somewhat comical indeed, my sarcastic way of saying it. Excellent, okay. <laughs> All right. Now, d is this unsettling for anybody? 
what's the next natural thing you might want to have available to you? What, maybe you actually kind of want to be able to print out the actual color point 2D print function, right? right think about that, right? Okay, so if you want to slice away an object, go ahead, slice it away, create a completely new object. You're just dealing with objects. But that color point 2D object, P2, that's still a color point 2D object. It has properties of color. Okay? So even though a point 2D pointer is pointing to it, something you might want to actually do is check to see what type of object you're actually pointing to, and then do what? Print that type. Call that class's print function. In other words, you want to check. If I'm pointing to an object of type color point 2D, then print that print function. Otherwise, print the default one. And you can do that. Question. Great question. OK, so do you guys remember references? So like if I have int, uh, just real quick, this is a great question. The question was about references. If I said references equal to a, if I said a point 2D reference equal to a color point 2D, what the heck will that do? OK, let's just recall. If I do int a equals 5, you remember, some of you, when you first learned 10a, probably when you saw this statement, you probably thought that meant a and b were like tied together. They referred to the same location in memory. It's common if you took Java or something, OK? But no, you learn in C++, we'll create a separate variable called b. We'll just grab the value of 5 and create a new variable b. Okay? And then later on, perhaps, when we, you learned about function parameters, we emphasize really more there's a data type called like an int reference, just like an int pointer. An int reference means, well, wherever you see a, b and a refer to the same location in memory. Okay, and that way, for example, when I write uh, b equals seven, and then I try to see out a, then a magically gets changed to seven, and it's because we're not creating a new variable b; it's we're creating another way to refer to those contents in memory. So let's see. The question becomes: How do we apply this same logic, the same idea, with Classes and class inheritance. Not necessarily polymorphism. There's nothing pointery about this inherently. Okay? So point 2D reference, let's see, PTR ref equals, and let's try and give it P2. That worked. Okay? Let's try to call PTR ref dot print, and let's see what happens. Let's get rid of this. What does it print out? Five six. Okay. So what you what you find what you learn eventually is that references are a lot like pointers. They're a lot like pointers. They're not identical to pointers, but they're very similar. They do very much similar things, but there are key differences. So yes, all this pointer intuition, um, let me very cautiously say, more or less transfers over to references. I wouldn't be so careless as to say I, I, I know all the different subtleties, but it should work for the most part from what I, from what I know. Okay? But what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to demonstrate it works for pointers, and then if you're curious about how it works for references, I won't demand you know how it works for references, but if you wanted to see how, how it carries over, you're welcome to. Yeah. OK, so if I told you that point 2D reference was very much like a point 2D pointer, then this behavior makes a lot of sense. OK? Let's just put references behave like pointers in many, many respects. And there's a good Stack Overflow article. On Stack Overflow, there's a lot of people that ask these fundamental questions like, what's the difference between a pointer and a reference? And then they get like all these really good answers, and then one gets upvoted a bunch of times, and then you see this really carefully well thought out answer by someone who's really worked with these structures a lot and understands how everything's implemented. So I'll refer you to that for more info.
Um, okay, so back to this. How do we tell our pointer type to check on the actual type of object that we're actually pointing to? And then in the case of overloaded print functions, call the actual color point 2D print rather than the point 2D print. So first of all, the question should be, is that even possible? I mean, it's a point 2D pointer, so it shouldn't have that syntactically built into it, right? Well, it will if it's overloaded, right? So if you have a function like print that is implemented both in the base class, so the point 2D pointer is aware of a function called print, and you have a function of the same name, print, with parameters, implemented in the derived class, then you can call ptr arrow print, and while the program is running, it can check before it calls the print function precisely which type of object it points to, and then print out the, the, the one that's the, most, the least base, you know, the one that's more resembling the object and its properties. Okay, So you need two things. You need the same function in both the base class and the derived class, like our print function. And then you need the base class pointer to call that function. And you need one more keyword. One more keyword. So as you saw, PTR points to a color point 2D object. And it calls the point 2D print function. How do we tell it to check what type of object it is pointing to and call that function? You add a keyword called virtual. OK, now watch this. All I did was add the keyword virtual to the base class, point 2D print function. Build succeeded. Now what did it do? OK. It, oops. It printed out the actual, it called the color point 2D version of print rather than the point 2D version of print. Okay. Why does it do this? Funny story. Um, no, it's not that funny. Okay, so what it does is it creates a lookup table. When you assign a pointer to the point 2D pointer, when you give it an address, if there's no virtual anywhere, in the base class of point 2D, no table is created. It always calls the point 2D base class functions. The moment you put in virtual, it creates a lookup table. And then every address you give, that point 2D pointer, creates a table that, that ha has both the object and its true data type. Okay? Then whenever you call or try to invoke a function using that pointer, it goes through this table, and then it figures out which function to call based on what type of object it actually is. That's what's called a V table. That's also in your book somewhere. Okay? That's how this works. So without virtual, everything is what would be called static. Okay? You just figure out what function to call, and you call it, and everything is known at compile time. You put in the keyword virtual. Now the computer or the compiler writes code in such a way where while you're running the program itself, it will determine precisely what type of object you've decided to point to. This ties into your homework assignment number four. If you try to do it without polymorphism, it will be incredibly annoying and difficult. If you do it with polymorphism, it is actually quite simple. Okay? And this is the key. The key is sometimes it's important to do the hard task and do it the hard way, but sometimes there's an easier way to code it up. Okay? And that's the emphasis here. We're not looking for you to just mimic the behavior. We're looking for you to adopt this technique, which will allow you to write code much more efficiently. And that's part of the goal. OK, so the reason why this is really cool is because then I can have a bunch of point 2D pointers. And as long as they all share the same base class of point 2D, um, it doesn't really matter. 
I don't have to think about making sure to have them call the appropriate um, print function. I don't have to specify, you know, call this print, call that print. Um, okay, so in this case, the first 5.6 here, uh, right above the blue 5.6, is because we called PTR print, and PTR now points to the color, or just the point to the object P3, and then PTR2 still refers to that one, the color point to the object, so it, prints, it calls the print function in the class color point 2D. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's see what else I wrote on these slides. OK, all you have to do is add the word virtual to your function declaration in your base class. That's what that's saying. There's no virtual anywhere else. You don't need virtual anywhere else. You just need it in the base class. And then it's fine. You don't even need it in color point 2D. You just need it in the base class. And you're good. OK, so after you put in virtual in the base class, here, you've got a bunch of uh, points and then um, of different types. And you can call for auto x in points, x print, and it will figure out which type of object it actually is pointing to and print out the respect and call the respective print functions. OK, so let's see. This is called dynamic versus static. And there's a small section on your book about this. So without virtual, and this is important because Virtual slows down the speed of the program tremendously. It's not necessarily a bad thing. If you need it, you need it. To write good, efficient, easy to read code, sometimes you, it's really a good tool. Okay? But the point is, is that without the virtual keyword, every single function, every single function call gets mapped during the, during the compile phase to a specific set of code. So w while the program's running, there's no checking anything. It just goes. When you throw in virtual, it has to throw in this lookup table, this V table. And that is a bunch of conditional statements that are really slowing it down. Okay? So don't worry about speed right now, but just be aware of the fact that virtual is a wonderful tool that really can slow down uh, uh, performance. The trade-off is, is the coding required is so much nicer. It's so much easier to code. And that's a big deal. It's easier to debug. And more importantly, it's easily extendable. There are a lot of things that you do, a lot of code you write, which is not meant to just be used once in this particular black box fashion, and then that's it. A lot of the code you write, like your polynomial class, what did you use your polynomial class for for this Friday's homework? What are you going to be using it for for this Friday's homework? The rational class, OK? It's not just you use the polynomial class and you're done with it. You're going to keep using these classes over and over again. They need to be easily extendable and usable. And that's the idea. With polymorphism, if you create a class hierarchy, you create a point 2D class, color point 2D, weighted point 2D, another type of point 2D, well, you can create as many different types of classes as you want. And as long as they all inherit from point 2D, the code that you write will be more or less the same. You just make sure the pointers point to the appropriate class type. Okay? That's the idea. Here's a term. A collection of mixed types of objects is called polymorphic, hence why it's called polymorphism. It means of many shapes. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. So the question basically is, are all functions virtual just by labeling one function virtual? The answer is no. So let's, let's prove that by creating a function called move. Um, and let's say move resets the color to white or something. Okay, So let's go down below here. Here we go. Here's our move. We'll just copy and paste it. 
And in fact, you know what we'll do just to make it easier? I'm just going to put a C out statement here saying you know. Ah. <laughs> okay, so here's a good question. How would I implement the color point 2D move? How about just by calling the point 2D move? OK, how's that? Good. See what I'm doing there? I don't want to write any new code if I don't have to. If I can utilize old code, I will. OK, now let's see what happens if we try and call ptr.move versus, oops, ptr arrow move versus ptr2 arrow move. Okay. Oops. Give it two values. Okay. So move is not virtual. Print is virtual, but move is not virtual. Okay. Let's see what happens. Now, if I call the color point 2D version of move, what will be different? We'll get that print statement. Did I get the print statement? I didn't get the call you call the point to the. Okay, so let me put a, a print statement in the uh, the regular one just to make sure that this is working too. This is the point to D move. Okay, so I have two calls to the point to D move, even though the print function is virtual. Now, how would I get it to call the respective functions? I would add a virtual specifically to move, but only, it's only needed in the base class declaration. That's the only place you need to put virtual. Okay. Now, if I recompile it and rerun it, well, that was weird. Oh, that's not weird at all. No. <laughs> Why is that not weird? Why is that not weird at all? Yeah, because we called the point to D move function inside of the color point to D move function. So that, that's exactly what should have happened. Okay? So that's, that's that. Um, so there's one thing I skipped over, and it's called null. And let me just briefly, in the two, two minutes we have left, um, Okay, you know how after you call new, you should call delete eventually to get rid of the heap memory? What do you do with that pointer when it's done? You set it equal to something, right? Like null. And that means that it's not pointing to anything. And that's a safe way to test if you can dereference a pointer, right? You say, oh, okay, if the pointer is equal to null, I can't dereference it because it's not pointing to anything, and it's a safer way to do things. Okay. Um, the reason I'm going through this now is this is a really quick thing. Wherever you see null in your book or anywhere else from now on, you're going to replace it with, wait for it, null ptr, all lowercase. Okay? Um, just replace everything with null ptr, lowercase null ptr, if you're going to use null anywhere. Okay? Where have you seen null used before as well? From 10a? Say again, louder. Time. See the right time library, random numbers, right? Um, srand time null. OK? I don't have time to go over this exactly right now, but I just want to draw your attention to something. Um, srand time null or srand time zero. You see both of these, right? Or at least saw one of them. This is really bad. Try typing in SRAN time one and see what happens. Okay? Th this is why we need a data type called null PTR. It's a keyword, it's a very specific um, keyword. Okay? So we'll start class with that next time and I'll go over the subtleties of what is the difference between capital N U L L 
and then lowercase null PTR. 